when it comes to, to preaching, there's nothing I take more seriously. And I know everybody feels that way about your career and what you do. The Lord showed me something um, years ago that was very vital to my life, is not to deliver sermons, but to deliver messages, which means that I'm going to be wrestling all week. Uh, last week, someone asked me, Mark, you're talking about this identity, intimacy, and expression thing. How long are we going to be doing that? And I said, I don't know. Uh, you know, we, you wrestle with me. We wrestle through what God is saying to us as we go through this. But there's one thing that I hope that you pray for that I think is just so vital and that is needed in our church today, not just in Central, but in the church as a whole, the Bride of Christ, is that I'm really praying, God, I pray that as I wrestle, it's not an echo, but it's a fresh voice. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying something that somebody else has said, but I want to I want to I want to get so close to God. I hope this is your prayer, too. I believe God is real. I believe that he's personal. I believe that he has a word for us today. And I want to hear that word and I want to walk in it. And I, I don't want to be an echo just saying what's been said in the past. I want a fresh voice from God. And as we talk about this identity thing, it is huge. And, 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 and I think it's just incredible. And sometimes people wonder, what is an identity? You talk about identity. What does it mean to, to, to have an identity? Let me kind of give you a little bit of a definition of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, identity is that thing that you find your worth in. And, and, and you've got to be careful here. And this is the struggle we have with stolen identity because so many people think I find my worth in what people say about me or what my job is. And these things, they can fade away in your identity, your crater. And uh, another way to look at it is this, is it's the qualities, beliefs, etc. that make a particular person or group different from others. And so we, as followers of Christ, we say our identity is in who we are as God's child. But you know as well as I do, often identity uh, becomes more involved with something we can see on a daily basis. We identify with the university. We identify with what people say about me. We identify with my job. We identify with, with whatever it may be. And if we do not get our identity from the right place, I guarantee you we're not going to make it. And I'm not talking about life. I'm talking about as followers of Jesus. We will not make it in this world. I think about this generation of young people that are here. I'm telling you, if you do not find your identity in Christ, we will be looking for you someday. But if you find it in Christ, your life will be different. And the millennials, the generation if you, that is our current young adults, I'm not a big one on, on labels because I think that you can label people and they never fit in there, but, but the millennials are really struggling with identity. And I read a blog that I want to share with you from a, from a young man who is a millennial. And, and I thought, man, this is, this is describing a lot of us, not just the young generation, but a lot of us. And it says this. I'll just read it to you. I think it's very good. Twitter is dead, or so they say. I only just recently started taking my 140 character game more seriously, but I've come to realize, more like reaffirm, that I have an identity problem. I've changed my Twitter bio more times than I can count and find myself losing sleep over how others will perceive it. In case you haven't noticed, the bio section of every social media profile has become an abridged resume listing both profession and, often, past experience. And I'm bothered by the fact that at the moment, I don't have credentials to put in. I get it. If you want followers, you have to tell people who you are. And for many, this has come to mean what you do. But how much of that are you taking to heart? And what if you haven't figured that out yet? What if you aren't happy as a designer, writer, creative director, or whatever label you'd like to use? Perhaps you're working towards these titles but can't own it. How do you maintain appearances without this self-doubt chipping away at your soul? Identity is personal. Identity is who you are at the core of your being when no one else is watching. Identity is the character of that person you turn, in the mirror, turn to in the mirror and when faced with a moral life question. Identity is what would be left if you were to lose it all. Many of us build our identity on a job title, financial status, marital status, the list goes on. For millennials, identity might stem from the number of comments like likes and or followers you get. However, we are not all suited to become insta-famous, award-winning Snapchatters, or YouTube sensations with stellar careers by 26. And guess what? That's okay. 
It's perfectly fine to be on your career hustle. But if things don't work out or you have to take a shift in direction, remember that before you became a label, you had value in a different way. For me, I find that value in my Christian faith. But I am also a son, brother, friend, neighbor. The list goes on from there. And more importantly, I carry with me an infinite amount of potential to change, to do something different, to help others. These are the things that matter. Next time you are filling in that bio section, remember that labels are just that, labels. Don't set your work on something that you can be, can be deleted with a few clicks of a keyboard. And this is where we are in our nation. It's not just millennials. It's all of us. I mean, when, when we come up to one another, what's the first thing after our name? It's what do you do? Because we measure our identity by what we do or what you say about me. And the scriptures, listen, that's not here. And that's why I think if we do not grasp this, that we're going to see the church flounder. We're going to see, especially a new generation, are not going to walk with Jesus anymore because they're looking to other things to find identity. So I want us to look at this. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 10. And, and we're going to be looking at this. And I'm going to ask you to keep your devices on or your uh, Bible open as we look at this. Because the scriptures, I told you that if we're going to find our identity in Christ, how do we go about doing that through the scriptures? Well, we look in the New Testament and we see, we see uh, relational uh, relationships between us and God. And it's used in the form of analogies that are in there. Last week we talked about what I think was the hardest one for me personally was slave and master. But when we know where our master is, we don't mind submitting. And today is kind of the same way. We're talking about sheep and shepherds, which I know somebody's going to come up to me afterwards, Doug Gilbert, and you're going to tell me everything I need to know about a sheep that I don't know. But, but this is going to come straight from Jesus in the teaching here. So, so John chapter 10 and we're going to be going through 1 through 18, but I'm going to stop at verse 6, after verse 6, and we're going to talk about some things here. It starts out by saying this, very truly. And if you've got a King James, it'll say verily, verily, or truly, truly. What this really means is, is this is important. What I'm about to say to you is very important. Jesus is speaking. He says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, who were the religious leaders, who the chapter previously had just put a blind man who had received his sight. They kicked him out of the synagogue. How about that? I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never. And, and the interesting thing about the original language, the Greek, Greek language is a little different than us. It just, when we say never, it would literally be in the Greek, there's more emphasis. It means never, no never. It means this is, this is a definite never. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. And Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them, they had no self-awareness. I read, I, read, I read a story this week I thought was pretty interesting. It was about a travel guide in Israel. And they were leading me on the bus, and this lady is talking about this very passage, how the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, and they always trust the shepherd, and the shepherd leads them. And she's given this great pastoral uh, picture of what's happening only to see when they came to a part in the road, they're looking out there in the field, and the sheep are just running. And the shepherd, it looks like this guy's running after him, and the sheep are just going every which direction that they're doing that. And, and, and so, man, she says, stop the bus, stop the bus. The bus pulls over, and she gets out, and she yells at this guy out there in the field, come over here. I just gave this beautiful picture about how the sheep are not afraid of the shepherd and about how that they are always there. They will listen to the shepherd's voice. And I look up there and this is totally not it. And he looks at her and says, sorry, ma'am, I'm not the shepherd. I'm the butcher. <laughs> Which really proves the point that the sheep know what to run from. But I want to I want to talk to you about sheep just a minute and how we identify, because it's used throughout Scripture that we are like sheep. Some of you have raised sheep, you kind of know, know some of these things, but let me just kind of share with you some of them right quick about the sheep. But first of all, the sheep pen here that he's referring to, Jesus is going to be referring to, is referring to his kingdom, those that are in his kingdom. 
And he's actually going to give two pictures. The, the other one I'll give you in just a moment. But he gives two pictures of a, of a shepherd in Jesus' day and what they would go through with their flock. One is right here. He says that when they bring them, basically when they bring them back close to the town, the village, that they would put all the sheep together in a pen. In other words, multiple shepherds with all their sheep in the pen. And there would be a gatekeeper that would be there who would allow that shepherd in. He would recognize that shepherd and he would come in. There's actually a, a beautiful picture here that if you can understand it, is that this, now we're talking about in the village, they all bring them together. Gatekeeper, here comes the shepherd, lets him in. There's a beautiful picture when you look at this, is that if the pen refers to the kingdom, and, and the shepherd is Jesus, well, we're thinking, well, who's this gatekeeper here that it's talking about? Well, when you think about it, and I think this is a beautiful picture in Scripture, is that you cannot come to Christ, hear me on this, unless God draws you. And how does He draw you? He draws it through His Holy Spirit, who brings that conviction, who sets the stage for the coming of Jesus into your life. Can't you see how the gatekeeper is the Holy Spirit? And that He comes and He recognizes the shepherd, and the shepherd comes in. I think it's a beautiful picture. The second picture that we're going to get in just a moment in the Scripture is if the shepherd has his sheep out in the field. He can't get them back to the pens, so they're out there in the field. So what he does is he finds an area that's rocked off that will have three sides to it. And there's one open side. And he's going to call himself the gate. Literally what it means is, is the shepherd will put his sheep among the three walls and he will be the gate. He will be there to let the sheep out, to let the sheep in, to make sure no predators come in. It's a beautiful picture of how Jesus is the gate. But we'll get there in just a second. So what is a sheep? I mean, why are, why are we compared to sheep? Well, let me give you four characteristics of sheep that I think are pretty interesting. One is this, is they constantly need provision and care. Uh, a sheep is, a, is an animal that is fairly defenseless. They are prone to nibble themselves into lostness. Most of you remember the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. There's a great, I think to me, is one of, the, one of the most prophetic words in any song that I've ever heard, secular or Christian or whatever. It says this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Man, that's just me. I'm prone to wander. And that's the way a sheep was. He'll nibble himself into lostness. He'll eat a little here, eat a little there, eat a little bit there. And, and also he is defenseless. There's nothing in him that, that is there to attack a predator back. He is... He's at the mercy of whatever happens. And there's actually a term called cast sheep. Uh, and what that means is, is that sometimes a sheep may have stubby legs or get a little overweight or too much wool, or the, the sheep may be pregnant. And what happens is, is something happens and he gets turned over or she gets turned over. And in such a way that because of the way they're so weighted down, they literally cannot get back on their feet. And a sheep, because of the way they are, will die from distress of being on their back and not being able to get back over. That's how defenseless they are. That's how they need a shepherd, just to get righted up so that they can go on with life. That, that's a sheep. They are constantly in need of care. And, and listen, I know some of you in this room are very independent, self-made, can do it all. Let me tell you, it can be gone in a heartbeat. You are in need. You are, you are one who is in need and care. Here's the second thing about a sheep, is they need a flock. Now, this was interesting. A sheep or a lamb by itself um, will show a lot of timidity, will, will show distress, will show fear. But if you take two or three other sheep and put with it, there's a security that that sheep feels. Does that not describe us? I know some of you are thinking, oh, Mark, I could go live out in the mountains by myself and don't need anybody else. I do not think you will flourish as a Christ follower that way. I don't think you'll become all that God intended for you to come. We need each other. We need other people to be iron sharpening us. We need other people that we can, we can trust. We need other people that we can thrive with. And that's the way a sheep is. Here's a third thing about sheep. Sheep know their shepherd. They actually know their shepherd. Um, and they fully trust their shepherd. Uh, there's a book called uh, Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and there's actually a story in there a rabbi tells about going out in the Middle East and seeing an oasis that several shepherds have brought their flocks to. And he's thinking, this is going to be chaotic. This is all these sheep together at this watering hole. This is going to be chaotic. So what he does is he, he says, I'm going to watch this. And so what happens is, is that 
there are four flocks there. One shepherd starts heading this direction with his specific call for his sheep. And his sheep started lining up to follow him. The next shepherd went this direction with his specific call. The, the sheep followed him. The other one went that direction. The other one went that direction. And before you know, the oasis was eventually uh, free of any sheep. No longer sheep there because they had followed their shepherd. Sheep, God created them in such a way that they know their shepherd. And we have the incredible privilege of knowing our shepherd. God created mankind with a need for him. I mean, he didn't create us with that need, but that need came because of the fall. And he is the one that we know. I'll talk more about the shepherd in just a moment. But here's one more thing about a sheep. A sheep, these particular sheep here are not butchered sheep. These sheep are not sacrificial sheep that Jesus is referring to here. These sheep are actually sheep that are, that are raised for their wool. Okay? So they would, they would develop wool. And with that wool, they would cut it off and they would have cloth and do it. So in other words, a sheep is created to give to the shepherd. There's no sheep that when he's been sheared, all of a sudden says, excuse me, would you bag that up for me, please? It goes to the shepherd. And so what they do reflects back upon the shepherd. And that's what this sheep does here is that they give back to the shepherd. Good wool shows a, a well cared for a shepherd, a shepherd that cares for the sheep. You're thinking, man, that sheep, he looks good. Look at all that wool on here. Man, that shepherd must be good. But if he's scrawny and he's, he's sickly looking, people are going to probably say, man, that shepherd's not taking very good care of his sheep. So you can see how they were created. A sheep is created for his shepherd. You, you and I, listen, <laughs> we think it's all about us. You weren't created for you. You were created to give glory and fruit back, produce back to your creator. And that's, that's who we are. That is the sheep that we are. Now, let's go on, though, because I want to talk about the shepherd. It says this in verse 7. Let me read to, the, to verse 18. It says, Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, remember I said that's extreme importance, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Remember the picture I showed you a minute ago? The three walls, the gate. Jesus is saying that very thing. Listen, I'm the gate. I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. And just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be, there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Verse 16 is very interesting because I've even heard people say before, Mark, do you think that's referring to Christians on other planets? That he has, he has followers on other planets and he's going to bring them? First of all, I'm thinking, did you really just ask me that question? <laughs> and, and, and then and then the thought behind that is, is well, it doesn't make it doesn't refer to something that we know in our culture. But he is speaking to Jews here. OK, he is speaking to God's chosen people. And as many times you wonder, are you and I ever really mentioned in Scripture? We're mentioned right here because he says, I have an, I have other people. Who is he referring to? He's referring to the Gentiles. He's referring to you and I who have no Jewish ancestry in us whatsoever. We know that the Jews were God's chosen people. He is saying here, I have other people. I have others that are going to come. They're going to be Gentiles. And it's going to be the same way. They're going to come through me. And so you wonder if you're in Scripture. There you are in verse 16. Verse 17 and 18. Let me finish. It says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down. That's the fourth time he says, I lay down my life. Of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Uh, let me talk about the shepherd just a minute. Because he's saying, 
he, he is referring to that there is somebody else that's going to try to take the sheep. And he calls them thieves and robbers. Thieves actually refers to, this is interesting, thieves refers to those who do it by deceit, false teachers. In fact, it's the same terminology, thief, that was used for Judas. It was, he was a thief. He, he brings deceit. And you see this in our culture, don't you? I mean, you see it in Christian churches, people who will stand on platforms and give you stuff that is feel-good stuff or it's stuff that will deceive you and lead you astray. You deserve more than that. And so we see that in, in those kind of thieves. And then there's robbers. Robbers are those that do it by force. They just force themselves onto people. It's the same terminology that was used for Barabbas. You remember the guy who was the insurrectionist and the murder that was released and Jesus was crucified? It's the same terminology for that. You've got others. Some are deceitful. Some are just going to force themselves onto you. And that's what they're going to do. And he says, these are going to come, but I am the true good shepherd. I am the gate. What does that mean? Well, here, let me give you some things about the shepherd I think that are important. Number one is this. He knows each of his sheep personally. Many shepherds would give their sheep names. Now, it wouldn't be like, like uh, you know, I don't know what you want to call a sheep, but, but the lamby or whatever it may be. That, that wasn't the deal. What he would give them names about is a characteristic about them. You know, there's a broken ear. There's a walks with a limp or something, you know, uh, scrawny. Stumpy, whatever he may call them, he was going to call them something that was going to show them. But he knew them that well. You know, I think our great shepherd, good shepherd, knows us so well. He has names for us, too. And it's not Mark or Pam or Carrie, Alan or Amy or whatever it is. It, I mean, he has names for us. It, it could be what he sees in us that we do not see in ourselves. You know, there's a kind guy. There's a, there's a good guy. There's a righteous person. And we see ourselves as so cruddy, and I think he looks at us with beautiful eyes, and he sees us differently. He knows you personally. Listen, I know some of you are going through really some hard times in this room. I know you are. And it's confusing, and you're thinking, I'm all alone. I want you to know you've got a good shepherd that knows you personally. He knows all about you, and he is fully trustworthy. He knows what you need. He knows, he knows there, and he is speaking to you, and he wants you to know his voice. So number one, he knows each of his sheep personally. Number two, he leads his sheep. He doesn't force the sheep somewhere. He's out there leading the sheep. And that's what that's the good thing about our great shepherd. And you know, Psalm 23 he leads them quiet waters. He, he leads them down the right path. This is our great shepherd. He leads us. And this is what's interesting. I want you to hear me on this, okay? God is leading you. He does not change. His character does not change. He does not change. But let me tell you. He is leading you. And we got to get that. Because our tendency, default, is to idleness. And here comes the great shepherd and he says, I need to lead you. I need to lead you to where you need to be. And I'm leading you. That's huge. And he leads us. Thirdly, here's a third thought about shepherds. Provides and cares for his sheep. He... He is the gate. He protects from the predators and the thieves and the robbers. He leads us to those grassy areas. He is providing for us. He knows your need. Hear me this. He knows your need before you even ask. He knows your need. He provides for you. Fourth thing about a, a shepherd is this. He sacrificially loves his sheep. Jesus said four times, I lay down my life, I lay down my life, I lay down my life, I lay down my life. That's how much I love my sheep. I lay down my life. I'm sacrificially loving them. He says it four times. And he is willing to be the gate. Any predator that comes, he's willing to deal with it. He just is willing. That's the kind of love he has for you. I, I, as I study through this, I'm thinking, God, what does this mean for us today? I, I understand you're the good shepherd. I understand that we are sheep. But what does this mean for us today? I want to make what I think are three profound statements out of this passage that I want you to see. Number one is this. There is only one way into the kingdom, and that is through Jesus. There's only one way. Folks, I know you, you say, oh, I know that, Mark. I've heard that a thousand times. You just heard it a thousand and one. Because our world is looking for so many different ways to get to God. And there is only one way. It is through Jesus. He says it himself. I am the gate. I am the way in. 
And he was telling this to these Pharisees that were looking for religious good conduct, keeping the law, all these kinds of things. He says, I am the gate. I am the way. And many of us need to hear that today. It's not going to be how rich you get. It's not going to be how many relationships you get. It's not going to be any of that. How good you are. You see, moral deism is controlling our culture today. If my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'm going to... No, no. It's only through Jesus. So he is the only gate. Second thought is this. He has obligated himself to take care of those, those who are his. He has obligated himself. See, you need to hear this. So many people think, man, if I could get committed to Jesus, man, if I give my life to Jesus and truly follow after him, he is going to make my life miserable. He'll make it miserable because you're still clinging so tightly to it. But I'm telling you, he has obligated himself. I read this and I get excited knowing that my great shepherd is going to provide for me. He is going to take care of me. Whatever, he's going to do it. He says, I am, and whosoever will. So, man, he's obligated himself. So there's only one way. He has obligated himself. And number three is this. He knows his own personally and intimately. He knows his own personally and intimately. He cares. He leads. He speaks. He wants you to follow him. I mean, that's the kind of loving, good shepherd that he is. You see how we can find our identity? It's one thing for us to say we're sheep, but it's another thing to know our great shepherd and to see how great he is. I have three questions for you to apply, and you can you can write these down. I just want them to, to hit you right where you're at. I want you to chew on them. I want you to be able to answer these directly. Number one is this. Do you know the shepherd? I don't mean do you know about the shepherd. I don't mean do you know about Jesus. You can tell the Jesus stories. You know Jesus died. You need know Jesus rose from the dead. See, this is, this is our culture. We know so much about it that we're gospel hardened to the fact that the ever-loving God who wants to know us intimately, and he wants us to know him. Do you know the shepherd? Are you, are, are, are you willing to come today and say, Lord, there's something here I'm missing, and I, I want to know you. I, I want to I know that I am your sheep. I want to know that you, you know me. And he says it here, my sheep know me. They know my voice. Do you know him today? He knows you, and he has provided the way, and he's waiting for you to come. So do you know the shepherd? Question number two is this. Are you following the shepherd? Are you listening to his voice? Or are you running so fast that you can't get still enough to hear him speak? But I think it's sometimes... I'm about to say something I know is true. It's not just a matter of hearing him. It's a matter of trusting him. Or can you trust him? Can you trust a shepherd like that? Or are you saying, no, 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 I cannot trust him. Third question to apply is this. Is your life producing wool? Is your life producing? In other words, how is your life reflecting back on Jesus, the shepherd? You say you're a follower of Jesus? What kind of fruit production is there in your life? What, how is he living that out and through you? And how much of it are you taking credit for? And how many of it is wool you're giving back to the shepherd? How are you producing? So do you know him? How are you doing in that relationship? I mean, are you close to him? Are you, are you following after him? And are you producing? I want you to hear these last couple of minutes because let me tell you, this is a warning. And it's a warning for me as much as there's a warning for anybody in this room. And I want you to hear this, especially if you call yourself a Christ follower. Because I think, I think this is a struggle that we all have. Remember I told you that a sheep will nibble his way to lostness. He's eating on a patch of grass here. He looks up enough to see another patch. He's eating over here. He gets in a patch over there. He rounds the corner a patch over there. And then he all of a sudden he looks up and he's away from the flock. He's away from the shepherd. He's nibbled himself into lostness. This is a warning. Lord, let me be clear. You can nibble yourself, even as a Christ follower, away from the closeness of the shepherd. I mean, there's some times you can think, God, there was a time, man, I just wanted to share you with other people. I wanted to grow in you. I wanted to be so close to you. I wanted to worship you. I wanted to pray. I just wanted to know the direction you have for me. And that's what I wanted. And then, and then sometimes you get to where we are today and you're thinking, God, how did I get here? 
why is it that I find my faith boring or apathetic or, or, or not challenging or not growing? Why? How did I get here? Well, I would be curious to know. It's not like you woke up one day over here on fire for God, and then all of a sudden you took a step and think, well, now I'm lukewarm. It never happens that way. You nibble yourself to that point. I, I nibble on the things of the world. I nibble on my own self-sufficiency. I nibble, nibble and fall in love with my career and with this and with this and with this, and pretty soon we find ourselves in this part of lukewarmness and we say, God, how did I get here? I think this is an incredible warning for us because, the, the, you know, the way for us back is to say, God, I, I don't know everything I did to get here, but I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I think you understand what I'm saying because, because I know in my own heart, I look at it and say, God, sometimes I find myself cold and I find myself not, not where I need to be with you. And God, show me, show me how to return. See, it's not just people that don't know Christ. It is sheep. It is sheep. They just have nibbled their way to a lukewarmness. You remember in the book of Revelations, Jesus talks to the church at Ephesus. And he says this, you're doing some great things, but this is one thing I hold against you. You have left your first love. Do you think they did that overnight? Do you think it was like, hey, let's just leave our love for Jesus? No. They fell in love with trinkets, and they fell in love with good deeds, and they fell in love with religiosity, and they fell in love with all of these things. And they nibbled their self away from the shepherd. Do you see how this is a warning? I think we, I think we run this warning every day. We've got to be careful about that. Let's pray. I, 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 just, I want you to chew on that a minute. I want you to chew on that a minute. I... I, I I'll just ask you to your heart, Christian, in this room, how are you doing? Really? Can you say, man, I have nibbled my way away from intimacy with a shepherd? Oh, I know him. I know, I know him. But man, I'm not close. Lord, open the eyes of our heart that we may see you. I would, I would venture to say that in, in this room as well, just because I know human nature is that there's probably somebody in this room that says, you know, I'm not a follower of Jesus. I don't know this shepherd. This is, this is, when's this going to be over? But there's somebody here today that maybe hangs on the verge of saying, Lord Jesus, you are the answer. You're the gate. I've tried many different things. I've followed many different shepherds, but you are the good shepherd. You are the true shepherd. And God, I just submit to you. I find my identity in you. I'm tired of getting it from work. I'm tired of getting it from what other people say. I'm tired from getting it from a Facebook account. I'm tired of getting it from my Twitter account. I'm tired of getting it from what I think are friendships. God, it has to come from you alone. He's waiting. In just a minute, there's going to be people up here to pray with you. Prayer teams, just get ready. These steps are an altar to come and kneel and pray. Maybe there's something that you've been nibbling on that you've got to lay aside, and this is just a good place to do it at. The Lord's Supper is also on my left. Just to, some of you are just saying, Good Shepherd, I need to return to closeness with you, and this is a way for me to do that today. God, you saw our need and you sent Jesus, the good, the beautiful shepherd, the gate. Lord, I got to just pray personally. Forgive me for when I nibble on this world and what other people think and what I do, my self sufficiency that are clinging close to you. Lord, I pray in the next couple of minutes that this will be just a thick place of your presence. We cannot, we cannot even, we, we, we're afraid to breathe almost because you're so thick.